that the Beast of Gévaudan attacked um, possibly as many as 200 people and killed anywhere from 60 to 120 people. And this was well documented in uh, death certificates and, and other uh, official documents at the time. The creature was ultimately killed and the body disappeared for a long time, may have resurfaced, we're not sure, but um, there was definitely, there was no doubt there was an animal, a creature of some kind that was sighted and blamed for these attacks throughout France. Uh, so this is, there's many, there are many images of the Beast of Jebedon. This is one that um, is, is a fairly well-known image. Um, as you can imagine, many of the, the illustrations from that time period are rather whimsical because that was the style of the day. But the general description of the Beast of Gévaudan, um, you know, obviously French is La Bête, the Beast, but I'll just call it the Beast of Gévaudan uh, for the sake of simplicity. The general description was an animal that was generally wolf-like in form, but very large, uh, described as being about the size of a calf. Um, with a wolf-like head, or some people describe its muzzle as looking pig-like, uh, covered in fur, but uh, somewhat shaggier and, and longer fur than a wolf typically has, um, small pointy ears, um, some people describe its color as reddish, or others describe it as brown, with a stripe down its back, or a fringe of hair down its back, a long tail with a tuft of hair on the end, which is interesting because, as you know, canids typically have a shorter tail, or not, not necessarily a long tail like this. And people also described it as having very pronounced claws, and that those claws in particular almost look like hoofs. Some people describe them as hoofs or talons. So that's the general description of the beast. And perhaps what the beast is known most for, as I mentioned, were the attacks. Um, the attacks began in June 19th, 1764. A young lady named Jean Boulet uh, was devoured, that's a word they used a lot in those days, was devoured by this creature. And the attacks continued for three continuous years and in fact caused mass hysteria throughout France to the extent that King Louis uh, the 15th, uh, who was the ruler of the time, and the Roman Catholic Church uh, pulled out all the stops in an attempt to get to the bottom of this and to stop the killings because as many of you history buffs may know, the 1760s in France was a very tumultuous period. It was right before the revolution. People were very disgruntled. There was a lot of poverty. People were starving. There wasn't enough food for everybody. And there was a lot of um, discontent, I'll say, for the uh, rulership of the time. Now, what's really curious about the Beast of Gévaudan is that it almost always attacked young people and women. Um, many of the victims were teenagers, 14, 15 years old. Many of them were females. Typically, they were targeted when they were out taking care of herds of animals, small animals, or livestock, rather, things like cows and, and sheep in isolated areas. And this particular region where the Beast of Gévaudan was encountered is in southern France, south-central France. It's a mountainous region, uh, smaller mountains, and it's actually one of the least populated regions, even today in Western Europe. So it's kind of an isolated region, and um, the, the beast roamed an area of about 50 miles by 50 miles, so it had a, a wide-ranging um, habitat. The reason that it was always attacking younger people and women that were typically alone is that uh, in that day and age, as I mentioned, people were kind of at a poverty level. The men would often do a lot of the hard physical labor, like building the house, fixing the house, and things like that. Whereas the, and the young people would chip in, the young people and the wives would chip in and tend to their herds of sheep or cattle or whatever and take them to the edges of the wooded areas to graze. And so the Beast of Gévaudan uh, would target these particular individuals. Now, what's really strange is that the Beast of Gévaudan never attacked the livestock, always targeted the humans. And so that's, that's really bizarre when you think about it. You know, you've got a flock of sheep or cows, and it, you know, it's going to attack the humans. So that, that is one of the real mysteries as far as why it did that. Um, it's going to be a, uh, I could literally do a two-hour lecture on the Beast of Gelodon. It's a very complex case. So I'm going to just try to, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to try to wrap it up into a neat little package for you. And we'll go to this next slide to do that. Now, the attacks on people 
And again, there, there, there are some discrepancies as far as the number of people that were actually attacked or killed. But at the minimum, 60 people were killed. And I've actually visited an entire graveyard full of its victims when I did the investigation over there. Um, some people claim that there were as many as 120 victims. So there's, it's a little ambiguous there. Um, but the nature of the attacks was very shocking. Um, many people were decapitated, found headless. Many people were um, disemboweled, and some of the victims were uh, essentially eviscerated, you know, limbs torn off and things like that. The Beast of Jebedon was said to often attack the head to attack the skull of the victim, human victim, which again, very abnormal. It's not typical animal behavior. As you know, canids will typically go for the throat or go for the legs if you're big and tall and intimidating. Big cats come from the top. so. But animals do not attack humans, typically, and they do not attack, or ever attack humans you know, by the skull. It's just not, it just doesn't happen. Um, so essentially, as I said, June 19, 1764 was the first attack. They were happening on a regular basis. Um, the first thing that happened is King Louis XV um, employed a local uh, militia uh, headed by this uh, captain named Duhamel, and he actually had a group of about 50 or 60 dragoons, soldiers, that were patrolling the area trying to hunt down this creature because people were in you know, complete hysteria that you know, this, this animal was killing at such a fervent pace. Um, however, that kind of inflamed the issue because these dragoons, these soldiers, were very abusive and they would take people's foods and you know, run rock shop through their, through their yards and things like that. So. Um, so that was the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened is that King Louis XV put a reward out on the Beast of Jebedon, hoping that someone could hunt this thing. And ultimately, when that didn't come to fruition, he sent his uh, bearer of royal arms, a guy named Marc Antoine, and also uh, a Norman squire who was the most famous wolf hunter in France who had killed 1,200 wolves, and sent these wolf expert, hunting experts down there to try to kill the beast. And they did ultimately shoot two very large wolves uh, that weighed in the neighborhood of 150 pounds, which is pretty big for a wolf. Um, however, um, the killings continued. After both of these wolves were shot, they were both declared to be the Beast of Jebedon, and then ultimately the killings continued and went on. And so, you know, as you can imagine, it, just, it was a very unsettling situation for three years. Finally, ultimately, in July of 1767, a local farmer and hunter named Jean Chastel shot an animal um, in an area known as Albert, where, um, and this particular animal, once it was killed, it was believed to be the, finally believed to be the beast, the killings did stop. And this particular animal that he shot was paraded through different villages, its, its corpse was paraded through different villages, and then after it was rotting and decomposing and smelly, it was finally taken to King Louis XV to immediately declare, get that thing out of here, go bury it or whatever. Just, you know, what, don't want to uh, be around with this smelly, rotting carcass. So that's the story. So the, the first mystery there was what, what happened to the remains of the beast? Where was it buried? One rumor is that it was buried in the royal garden. Another is that it was taken up to a, you know, a secret location and disposed of. So um, nobody really knew. Now, Talking about John Chastel for a moment, the guy that shot this thing, um, he was one of the best hunters in this particular region. And by the way, this, this region, I didn't mention it. It was known as the Gévaudan back in the day, but now it's referred to as the Lozere region or the Albert region. But um, Chastel, once he shot this thing, and the story is that Chastel was part of a, a larger hunt, and he was one of the few men that actually had a rifle in this particular area. So he was a skilled marksman with a, with a good rifle. And when they were going out to shoot the beast, the, the legend states that Chastel went and had silver bullets forged and actually um, blessed by a priest. And that he was sitting there in his little, I guess, deer blind type situation, reading a prayer book. And as, as if answered by God, that the beast of Jebedon walked right into a clearing right in front of him. And then he shot it dead with these silver bullets. Well, as you can imagine, Chastel became a hero. Uh, he was given a lot of money and education and became kind of a national hero down there, despite the fact that he was a little bit of a controversial figure. He had been involved in some dubious dealings and things like that. So 
but he was a, you know definitely a larger than life character. So that's you know in a nutshell that's the story of the Beast of Gévaudan. Um, it is one of the most famous legends in France and throughout Europe. And here you can see some different artists artistic interpretations, uh, some from that time period. This one up here, perhaps a little bit more recent, but the story has been re retold many times. And in the 1800s, uh, a French abbey named Abbey Pochet actually uh, put the whole story together and wrote a really excellent book where he compiled all of the, the killings and the different records that had to do with the beast. But modern cryptozoologists are not often familiar with this particular story because, again, it's 250 years ago that this thing happened. So, but, so that's kind of the story. And again, I was sent down to uh, sent over to France to investigate this particular case. And uh, as you can imagine, it was uh, quite an unbelievable uh, time. Now, I don't know if I should mention this now or later, but I'm just going to say that you know, there are already a lot of question marks, right, in terms of the method of killing, the number of people killed by this animal. So at the time, it was believed that the beast of Jebedon might be some type of uh, monster wolf, like a deformed wolf. Could be a pack of wolves working in tandem or just killing at that particular time. There was a lot, it was a harsh winter, and there were a lot of hungry animals as well as people. It could have been um, something exotic, some people theorize that maybe it was some exotic animal from Africa, like a hyena or a, or a lion or something like that. And then other people think to this day that it was a conspiracy and that there was either a serial killer involved or a group of serial killers, or B, that there was, this was somehow orchestrated by the rulership of the time, either the Roman Catholic Church or King Louis XV, because as you, as you all are aware, Fear is a very powerful tool in terms of governing people, particularly people that are kind of, you know, at that revolutionary state. So, so a lot of different layers and questions in terms of the mystery, and that's what the show is about. So as soon as we, uh, we arrived in France, we arrived in Lyon, France, and we're driving through the, down to the uh, Auvergne region, and I'm, I'm looking at things like this, and I'm thinking, this is surreal. I'm looking up at medieval castles, and I'm going to hunt a werewolf in, you know, a medieval werewolf in France. This is pretty cool. Um, the only thing I wish they had let me, you know, maybe put on like a long black trench coat and carry a crossbow or something like that. But I think they kind of shot some of those ideas down. So I just kind of <laughs> took, the, took the scientific high road. And uh, to this day, as I mentioned, this, this particular region is, is a, it's a very rustic and pastoral region. People still rely on livestock and farming and agriculture. Um, so we've had, we had, the, for example, this particular roadblock that we encountered as we were arriving in the area. So obviously, there are a lot of sheep and cattle and, and other livestock animals in this area. Um, and again, very low population density. So my partner in this particular TV show is the gentleman on the right is George Duker, or as I was calling him, Duke. Uh, he's the host of a TV show called Missing Persons Unit, which uh, he is a homicide detective from New Jersey uh, that basically hunts down serial killers and, and different types of criminals. So uh, the makeup of the show is obviously that uh, Duke was going to investigate the possibility that the Beast of Jebedon was in fact a serial killer of some kind, and that the, the story about the animal was just kind of a, you know, part of the mix, so to speak, but not the explanation per se. And I was going to look at the theory that the Beast of Jebedon was in fact some type of cryptid, some type of unknown animal or murderous creature. And uh, so we had a kind of a nice um, odd couple dynamic going on. Uh, Duke is a, is a great guy, he's a tough, hardened New Jersey cop, speaks with the, you know, the accent and uh, I've never seen anybody that was so uncomfortable in France before. He was just, uh, where can I get a hamburger? And this, with this roof, you know, is a, but uh, he had a good time, I think. But uh, uh, he's very proud to be American, and he let all the French people know that. So, but uh, here we are. Um, this is in Alvers, and right down the road here is the cemetery that I told you about, where there's uh, probably a dozen graves that. Uh, very old graves that are attributed to the Beast of Jebedon, victims of the Beast of Jebedon, I should say. The statue is um, portraying a particular attack or attempted attack by the Beast of Jebedon where a young girl was actually able to successfully defend herself with a spear. So there were, there were some people that were attacked or, or attempted attacks where people actually did escape. 
And uh, this is memorialized in this particular statue. And if you go kind of over the hill that we're standing on, and in the background over there is the forest where Chastel actually shot the uh, Beast of Jelenon. So we were, in, we were in the right spot for sure. Uh, by the way, I was going to say, um, we did a ballistics test at the end of the show. I don't want to give too much away in case some of you haven't seen it, but uh, I'm proud to say that I'm, you know, one of the real highlights of my life, I should say, is the fact that I was actually able to handle real silver bullets. So they actually, the producers actually had real silver bullets forged, and uh, we used those in the ballistics test. So I was like, ah, man, should have stuck one of those in my pocket or something for, for the dog man. But um, uh, this is Bernard Soulier. And um, Bernard, not only is one of his ancestors, was one of his ancestors a victim of the Beast of Jevedon, he still lives in the region to this day, but he's basically the world's, probably the world's leading expert on the case. And he runs a museum in Albert, France called the Beast House, where he has uh, many of the, uh, on the right hand side you can see a, a map of the area where he's pin, uh, pointed all of the uh, attack locations and um, you know, it's kind of a no-frills museum, if you will, but he does have copies of a lot of the very old archival records of the Beast of Jevedon, many of the attacks, the death certificates, the letters that were written back and forth between the king and all of these different people, the agents that he employed to try to hunt down the beast. And back at his house, he actually has an entire library filled with very old books with a lot of the documentation. So we were given access to a lot of just amazing now, granted, it was in French, but I had a, a translator, and she kind of helped me sort through all that. And then ultimately, we, he took us to some of the locations where the attacks occurred, the exact locations where some of these attacks occurred. And then ultimately, we were taken to the location where Chastel actually shot the animal. Here I am. Uh, I, as I said, this is a very famous story in France, and here I am um, just up the road from out there is the town of Sage, and uh, there's a um, beast statue there as well, kind of overlooking the town on this particular mountain. This one a little stylized, perhaps. Um, I kind of forgot to mention this earlier, but the beast of Jevedon was always described as a quadruped, almost always described as a quadruped walking on four legs. However, there are just a couple of sightings, at least two, maybe three sightings, or claims that it did walk bipedally a couple of times. And in fact, it was seen by some eyewitnesses allegedly crossing a river on its hind legs. So, you know, I, I was reluctant to include this in a lot of the dog man information because it, first, it's a very old story, and secondly, you know, we're talking about a quadruped versus primarily a biped. But uh, as Linda Godfrey has pointed out to me, she has many accounts in her database of dogmen walking on all four legs. So it seems that they can go on all four or up by Pete on two. And since the Beast of Jevedon was reported to do that as well, perhaps there is some kind of connection. Um, once we toured the partic that particular region and went through all the documentation, um, and what was really cool about this, guys, I'll just give you a little bit of insight of how some of these television shows work. Um, a lot of these documentaries and reality shows, particularly here in the United States, are heavily scripted um, because, and that there's a hierarchy that's involved because you have at the very top of that hierarchy, you have a network like the History Channel that's paying millions of dollars to have this thing produced. So they have the final say on everything, and there's a group of people there. Then in the intermediate level, you have the production company that's actually shooting it. And in this particular case, I was very lucky because it was a German production company with very deep pockets, and they were... They were all European producers that were very passionate and very like, we must get this shot right every time. And I don't want to um, digress too much, but for example, Duke was very annoyed with our director. He kept calling him uh, Spielberg, but it was a very uncompliment uncomplimentary way because we would shoot a scene literally 10 times in a row and you know we'd finish the scene and walk up and the producer would say, that was perfect, perfect, do it again. <laughs> And you go back and they do it again, and that's, ah, that was it, that was it. That, okay, one more angle, one more angle, you know, so, so it was quite a process. But anyways, um, originally the show was heavily scripted. When I was hired to do this particular show, they sent me a script, and it was basically, you're going to do this, 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 and this, and this. And I was like, okay, well, a little bit of a sacrifice there. Oh, and they also told me I had to ditch the hat. You guys probably noticed that in some of the pictures. They were like, 
History Channel doesn't really like the have. It kind of affects your credibility a little bit. And I was like, I'm going to hunt a werewolf. Come on. <laughs> really? But, okay. Hunting werewolves in France. Okay, I'll take the hat off. Yeah, so. But uh, anyway, so it was heavily scripted at first. And then, you know, I was kind of disappointed. And then there was a process that went back and forth between the network and the production company. And they decided that, thank God, the people at the History Channel decided, this is too scripted. We want this to be natural. We want this to be real. So the producers came back to me and said, OK, they want this to be real, so tell us where to go. What do we do? This is your investigation. We're just going to follow you around and let you do your investigations. It's like, awesome. So, so um, obviously, we were going to go to the area, but it was my idea. I was like, well, we have to go look at wolves you know, in France, because that is the animal that keeps popping up. Is it a wolf? Is it a wolf of some kind? Is it a rabid wolf? That was another theory. Are these wolves rabid? Maybe that's why they're attacking people. So we went to a French wolf preserve um, in the Gévaudan. It's run by a guy named Sylvain Maki. And they've got um, probably a couple hundred wolves there. Now, the wolves that are there are from France. Uh, not, not from France, I'm sorry. They're from Canada. Uh, some are from Poland and Russia. Um, and they're obviously in cages. Um, but we were able to get very close to the animals. In fact, they, walked, they let us go into one of the pens with these Canadian wolves which Duke hated. He's like, oh, are you crazy when I'm going there? I was like, oh, it's just wolves, you know, they're not going <laughs> And they did circle us, you know, they created a little posture where they were basically all around us and stuff. But Sylvain was there, and I knew he was a wolf handler. Um, but I should point out, there is a feral population, or there is a population of wolves in France. Now, right now, there's about two to 300 wolves in France, and most of those have come over from Italy. Back in the 1760s, there were a lot of wolves in France, but obviously a lot of those have been hunted through the years and so forth. So, but there are still wolves in France, and um, so we have to address the, the wolf theory. Now, what, I, what I'll say about wolves are, and many of you probably already know this, it's almost common knowledge, wolves are, despite their ferocious image, are very shy, retreating animals. They don't want contact with humans generally. Attacks on humans are very rare. Very rare. Even back in the 1760s, attacks by wolves on humans were extremely rare. Now, furthermore, wolves are typically social pack hunters, right? So they travel in different family groups and, and so forth with an alpha male and female and you know uh, relatives and so forth. But you know, the beast of Jebedon was never seen in a pack. It was always by itself, kind of a lone wolf. And there are some lone wolves that get pushed out of packs and kind of find their way. So that does happen. And furthermore, the physical description. Because despite the fact there were people, as I mentioned, that, that survived these wolf attacks, and what they were describing did not sound like a wolf. And believe me, the people in that region knew what wolves looked like. They were constantly defending their livestock from these you know, rogue wolves. So, so you know, I'm, I'm at least of the opinion that we we're dealing with some type of unknown animal, not a known animal like a wolf. But we still, we went and we studied wolves for a while and you know, to, had to come to those conclusions. Now, as far as the theory that these were rabid wolves, as you can imagine, rabid animals don't live that long. You know, once, they, once they're rabid, their lifespan is maybe a week, maybe a couple of weeks before they die. So the fact that these attacks continued for three years pretty much rules out that it was a rabid wolf as well. And then once we finished there, we uh, traveled back to Paris. And again, this was like my, my wish list. Where do you need to go? I need to go talk to this guy. This is Jean-Jacques Valois, one of the most famous French cryptozoologists. Sadly, he passed away in 2012. Um, but Jean-Jacques is a, he has a degree in zoology and ornithology. Um, he was one of the first cryptozoologists to use computers back in the 1980s and actually compiled all of the Beast of Gévaudan cases on his computer in order to see if there were different patterns in the attacks and stuff. So went to go visit with Jean-Jacques, and we had a, he doesn't speak English, so we had a nice, you know, translation going on there. Uh, he was, by the way, he was also very close to Bernard Hubelmans, who's the, the father of cryptozoology, and has written an excellent book about Bernard Hubelmans. Um, I gotta tell you this story, though, it's, it's too good to pass, it's, it's kind of comical. So for this particular scene where I'm gonna be talking with Jean-Jacques about the beast, 
He lives in downtown Paris, and they figured, okay, you're going to meet him at a cafe. This is so cliche. You're going to meet him at a cafe, and then you're going to go up to his flat, and he's going to have a bottle of wine and some French bread and cheese, and you're going to sit there and break the bread and drink wine and talk about the bête du Jabodon. And um, so at the time, he's like seven years old, and he's still living with his mom. And uh, she, was, she was a sweetheart, she was a character, and he's also got an obsession with owls, so he had like a hundred owl clocks on his wall, which was pretty awesome. But, um, so they get the bottle of wine, and they get the cheese and the French bread from the market. We actually bought the bread on the way, up to, well, let's get some bread and cheese, you know. And we get up to his flat, and we sit down, and we're like, okay, uh, we need some plates and, and cups for the wine and the cheese. Well, all he had in his flat was plastic, Dixie cups and, and plates. So they were expecting some like fine china and stuff to come out. He's like starts popping these plastic Dixie plates down on the plate, and they're like, oh. It was it was a really humorous moment, anyways. But um, Jean Jacques, um, his personal theory is that the Beast of Jabodon was in fact a serial killer, and uh, he, you know he he bases this obviously on many of the things that we've already discussed. That you know there's really no animal that fits the description. There's just too many victims, the mode of attack, all of these things in concert kind of indicates that you had to have some type of serial killer or perhaps a group of serial killers. And perhaps, as we mentioned, the rulership of the time actually may have been, there may have been a conspiracy to spread fear throughout the region in order to, you know, placate the people and kind of keep them in line. So, uh, you know, I certainly have to give a lot of weight to his theory because of the amount of time he spent researching the beast. And then finally, I went to the Museum of Natural History in Paris. Uh, here I am with a fossil of a coelacanth fish, which, as many of you know, is a pretty important fossil in terms of cryptozoology. Um, but they took me down to these vaults. This was pretty amazing. They took me underground under the Natural History Museum of France. There are these giant sealed hermetic vaults, and they opened these giant vaults, and inside were hundreds and hundreds of taxidermy specimens of every, pretty much every animal species that was known. Many of these are old, so we're talking about taxidermy mounts that are centuries old, many of them. And that was pretty unbelievable. But um, the forgotten part of the story that a lot of people don't know about is that in 1997, Franz Julien, who's in charge of all of these taxidermy mounts, found and documented an archive at the Natural History Museum that declared that the taxidermy Beast of Gévaudan had been on display at the French uh, Paris Zoo until 1819, and that the King's Royal Zoologist determined that the animal was, in fact, a hyena. So that was the, the theory that, so Jean Julien has been kind of pushing that theory that it was a hyena. Well, what do we know about hyenas? Hyenas are not canids, so they are actually closer, closely related to cats, not dogs. They are carnivores, so all of those animals are in the same kind of order, but they're in different families. Um, hyenas are very aggressive. Um, in fact, I found several articles from Africa where hyenas had attacked people. They are very, very aggressive. They're scavengers, too. Striped hyenas, more scavengers than, say, spotted hyenas, but hyenas are very aggressive, and they will attack people. And furthermore, they will attack people by the neck or by the head. And furthermore, they have the strongest bite pressure of pretty much any animal except for like a crocodilian in the animal kingdom. So they could literally bite someone's head off or someone's arm off. So there are some tantalizing clues in there in terms of, now how did a hyena get to France? A bit of a mystery, yes, but maybe not so much when you consider that France has had a very strong presence in Africa for centuries. And it was not uncommon for French noblemen and people to go down to France and collect exotic animals and take them back to France and have them on display. In fact, there's a rumor that Jean Chastel's son, Antoine, owned a hyena in his own personal menagerie. Uh -huh. So anyways, I don't want to give too much away, but um, uh, it's pretty startling. But we have a couple of other theories about the Beast of Gévaudan that I just wanted to go over real quick. Okay, this is one I wanted to talk about. We didn't really get into on the show, but this is an artist's interpretation of a cave hyena. Uh, Latin name is Crocuta Crocuta spilea. These hyenas were very prevalent throughout Europe during the Ice Age. And you can see in comparison to a human, they were much, much larger than modern hyenas. 
And so many fossilized bones of these giant cave hyenas have been found throughout France and other areas. There are paintings of these animals in different famous caves like Lascaux Caves in France and stuff. So humans definitely interacted with these giant hyenas. Now, <clears throat> it's highly unlikely that a prehistoric cave hyena could have survived into the 1700s. Very unlikely. Not impossible, but very unlikely. But I thought it was a pretty cool theory and that it was something that could be addressed <clears throat> because the physical descriptions are, in my opinion at least, kind of similar to the Beast of Jebedon. I mean, I heard Linda talking about this earlier, Andrew Sarkis. So Andrew Sarkis belonged to this group, the Mesonicids, or Masonicids. These were early carnivores that existed in, you know, like 30 million years ago during like the Oligocene epoch. And they're not, in, they look very similar to wolves, but they're not, in, in fact, they're more closely related to artiodactyls like horses and deer. They were literally wolves with hooves. They had five little hoofs on their the ends of their claws. <laughs> Excuse me. And they were, some of them, like Andrew Sarkis, were extremely large. So these animals went extinct when the modern carnivores, like the, you know, the canids and the felids and stuff, kind of filled that niche. And allegedly these animals, supposedly these animals went extinct millions of years ago. But the physical description based on fossil reconstructions of the Masonicids are almost identical to the Beast of Jebedon. So this has been a favorite theory of cryptozoologists for years, that there could be one of these surviving prehistoric carnivores like this. Now, there are some problems with the quote-unquote um, living fossil paradigm in cryptozoology. That is the possibility that a prehistoric animal could have survived millions of years without being detected. And I don't really want to go into that whole thing now, but it is something we explore as cryptozoologists because it has happened with the coelacanth and other animal species that have essentially been rediscovered. But 30 million years is a long time to disappear from the fossil history. And in France, you would expect that people would know that there was a population of these Masonic kids running around. OK, so that's kind of it for the Beast of Jebedon. Like I said, I have um, some DVDs for sale if anyone wants to check that show out. I think they did a pretty good job of it. Um, I'll see how much time I have left here. OK, I'm going to try to, I'm going to fly through this really fast. I admittedly have not done as much quote unquote dog man or werewolf research as many people in my field have. And it's not because of choice, it's just because down in Texas, you know, we, where I'm based, we don't have a lot of sightings or reports. Um, but it's something that's always fascinated me. Um, I, back in early 1990s, 91 perhaps, I was watching Inside Edition and I first saw Linda Godfrey talking about this beast of Bay Road werewolf and it was like, whoa, a werewolf in Wisconsin, that's crazy. So i um, been into it for many years and um, it's, it's just an amazing mystery and I'm glad we're here to talk about it because it's also something that's been neglected in terms of discussing different theories and possibilities. But in 2002, I actually traveled to Bray Road. At that time, I was in a band and we were touring around the country and sometimes I would convince my band to take these little diversions and say, you know what, we got a gig in Chicago. Let's, let's, we'll stay up here in this place called Elkhorn. And so we literally, we literally stayed, in, uh, stayed at Lake Geneva there in Wisconsin in the campground. And then at night, we drove up to Bray Road and we parked the, the van and just got out and started walking around with flashlights. And, um, I have to disagree with you, Linda. I think Bray Road is actually a very creepy place. <laughs> Especially at night when you got the corn stalks and you can't really see away from the road and stuff. So it was like, just knowing that this is the spot, this is Bray Road, and you know, running into the Taco Bell first and asking them, hey, is Bray Road around the corner? Because we're looking for that werewolf and you know, watching them roll their eyes and stuff. But, so this is my first attempt at dogman research in 2002 at Bray Road, but we were there very briefly, so. But it was just fun. Okay, so as far as Texas cases, um, there are there are a handful of, of Texas cases that may involve the dog man. One of the more famous ones happened in a place called Vider, Texas, which is in far southeast Texas, which is an, actually an area where there are a lot of Bigfoot sightings as well near the Big Thicket. And this is a famous case where in 1978, um, a, a young couple named the Bussingers were living in a trailer park, or a trailer home rather, on North Tram Road. And the residents encountered a creature that they called a werewolf. 
And this thing was, it actually killed some of their dogs. They could hear it howling and screaming in their yard. Um, it was banging on the walls of their trailer and breaking windows and different things. So they ultimately called out the local police who did a stakeout. And one of the law enforcement officers actually saw this thing lurking at the edge of the woods. So um, it was a pretty scary experience, but known as the Vider Werewolf. But um, anyways, iconic case, 1978, Southeast Texas, and physical description more or less matched the werewolf. And after a night or two of this thing going a month, this couple finally moved out and abandoned their, their trailer home. Well, as it would happen, in February of 2009, I was invited to Vider to do an investigation at this location, which is, as it happens, is only two miles away from where the Bussingers live in Vider, Texas. And some people living in a trailer home claimed that there was some creature living at the edge of their property, banging on the walls of their trailer, screaming and howling in the woods, and emitting a really horrible putrid smell. And one guy actually saw the thing and said it was actually, it looked like a big werewolf type creature on four legs. He saw it at the edge of the woods. So, you know, no brainer, of course I'm gonna go. So, um, I did an investigation. I went to the, two miles down the road, I visited the, the location where the Bussingers lived, and I met one of the girl, uh, Becky Bussinger's sister is now living in that location. And she tried to downplay the whole thing and said, yeah, you know, what really happened is that one of our relatives was strung out on PCP and he was just living in the woods behind the trailer and, you know, that's all it was. I was like, well, that doesn't really match the physical descriptions and even the law enforcement people said it was some kind of big hairy creature. But as you can imagine, some people want to kind of sweep it under the rug, you know, it's kind of weird that um, those things come up. But anyway, so we did an investigation of that particular property. And this is a track that I found, kind of at the edge of the woods in the background. And I know it's not the greatest picture in the world, but you guys can kind of hopefully see the shape of the footprint. Now, I made a terrible, terrible error here as a researcher. Can anyone tell me what it is? No, I forgot to put something in the picture for scale, exactly. And afterwards, but it was about 14 to 16 inches long, about the size of an average Sasquatch track, and it looked very similar. We also found kind of a nest-like structure in the woods behind the house. We did, so we did find some things. Ultimately, what I determined was, and I actually, I solved the mystery revolve, uh, involving the putrid stench because I found that there was a sewage leak right behind their property and there was like a cesspool of waste that was coming up out of the ground and smelled horrible. So I think we, we adequately at least explained that aspect of it. But as far as the creature, who knows? Thank you, Jason. Okay, so now it's time to discuss, and we'll probably get back to this later, the quote-unquote dog man is a type of Bigfoot paradigm, right? You hear that from a lot of researchers. Uh, there, there can't be a dog man. It's just a type of Bigfoot that's running around up there. And we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, I'm, I'm hoping, later, because, um, but as Linda so eloquently pointed out, I mean, the physical descriptions are radically different. Yes, they're both big, hairy creatures that walk on their hind legs, but Clearly, Bigfoot has a very flat face and, you know, not a long snout, which is what dog, you know, dog man would just always say, you know, this thing had a wolf-like head, large pointy ears, a long snout, so it's hard to kind of equate that to any type of hominid. Although I will point out, there are a few cases, for example, in West Texas, near El Paso, there's the Horizon City Monster, which is generally viewed as a Bigfoot or Sasquatch, although many of the eyewitnesses have said that it has a jaw like a dog or a bulldog, and then it has very large pointy ears and a sloping head. So almost canine-like features in the head to some respect. Um, now, I should also point out that many of our pre-human ancestors, Homo erectus, the Australopithecines and so forth, had a very sloping, flat head and in many cases had, you know, prognathism or a jutting jaw that stuck out. So even though they didn't look like canids, compared to us, their head, the shape of their head, and their jaw and so forth, did look more animalistic, you know, in many respects. You don't really know what their ears look like, of course, so that's just, you know, wild speculation. Um, now, I'd like to point out that many of the cryptids that I've investigated, particularly the really weird ones like the Jersey Devil, the chupacabra, 
even the Beast of Jebodon, I personally think that a lot of these cryptid cases are what I refer to as composite identity, meaning that you've got a lo essentially a lot of elements and things involved. So a certain percentage, a very small percentage, are basically people making up stories or misimagining things or misinterpreting an animal. So you know you have to take that into account. And then in many cases, you have perhaps known animals that are being seen and interpreted, like bears have often been related to the dog man. Maybe you saw a bear walking on its hind legs or something like that. And then you always have these other factors that are kind of mixed in and involved. So I have no doubt that some percentage, and I would only be speculating as to how big a percentage, but some percentage of dog man sightings probably are Sasquatches. Um, if someone gets just a fleeting glimpse of something on its hind legs, it's big, it's hairy, it's running through the woods, and you know, maybe for whatever reason, the way that you imprinted it in your mind, you thought, man, particularly if you're not a Bigfoot Sasquatch person or, or not real familiar with the phenomenon, you might say, well, I had this big hairy man-like thing, it was like, I don't know, a werewolf, you know? So you might have some of those situations. But I definitely don't think you can explain the dogman phenomenon simply by saying they're Sasquatch, they're Bigfoot. I think that's a huge disservice, especially when we consider all the things that the speakers are talking about today in terms of sort of, for lack of a better word, kind of metaphysical properties that are associated with dogman. I mean, they're seen in downtown areas, for God's sake. And, you know, the mists and the, and the transformations and all these things, so. But we have to consider all the angles here. Now, just outside of San Antonio, where I live, there's a legend of the converse werewolf, probably one of the most obscure werewolf legends. Um, the story goes back to the 1960s, although I haven't been able to find a solid source in terms of where it came from. But essentially, the story is basically like a parable. A teenage boy, a teenage boy was sent into the woods by his father as a rite of passage in a manhood. You've got to go hunt. You haven't hunted. You need to go hunt and kill something. He sees this creature, comes back home. No, Dad, I don't want to go out there. There's this werewolf monster. No, you get out there and go. And pushes him back. It's kind of like the boy that cried wolf, right? The father doesn't believe him. And then ultimately, the boy vanishes. A posse is formed. And when they go out to look for this boy, they find this werewolf-like creature, basically with the, the boy's lifeless body on his shoulder, running around at a place called Skull's Crossing. So this is a picture of Skull's Crossing today. Converse is obviously a well-developed area on the fringe of San Antonio. Um, there, other than this particular wooded area, I didn't find a lot of potential in terms of, uh, you know, dogman or other creatures. Uh, as I mentioned, there are urban dogmen. And I did find a large canid-like print, and chances, the, probably about 99.9% .9 chance that this is a dog's print. <laughs> There's just a big dog, about four and a half inches long, but I, you know, you're out there investigating a, a dogman and you find dog-shaped prints, you should at least document them. And also, redemption! <laughs> I remember to put the scale in there, it's a four and a half inches. It's a kingdom track, but I did not find the converse werewolf. And um, so that's it, ultimately. Now, I've got a new book coming out in September. It's called Menagerie Mysterious Beasts. And I cover a whole range of cryptids. Uh, Bigfoot type creatures, thunderbirds, giant lizards, giant spiders, giant amphibians, you know, weird apparitions and things. But I have a very small section on the Beast of Jebedon. And then I also write about, uh, I got a dogman report from Nebraska right after the Beast of Jebedon aired. Um, and more recently, I've been working with researchers around the world. And for example, there is a Brazilian researcher named Carlos Henrique Marquez that keeps sending me dogman reports from Brazil. And down in Brazil, it's known as the Lobison, or El Lobison, the wolf man. And it's a pretty big deal down in Brazil. Unlike here in North America, you actually can find stories on the, you know, the, the headline news and you know, so forth. So in some of these other countries, they will actually, instead of relegating a story like Dogman to the very last page of a newspaper is kind of a human interest story. It goes to like, you know, headline or second page, like, we've got a werewolf at Lopezon. So we are getting a lot of Dogman reports now from all over the world, Brazil, Australia, Europe. So it has become, in a very short time, it has become a global phenomenon. And these things are being reported everywhere now, uh, virtually everywhere. So that's one of the reasons I felt it was the right time to put together a Dogman symposium 
because it's 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 the time. You know, these things are out there. Whatever they are, people are seeing them and reporting them. Um, I guess that's really all I have for my lecture for now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up so that we can kind of stay on schedule because we are two more speakers and then we're going to have a experts panel where all the speakers are going to come up here on stage and address your questions directly and hopefully we'll have some engaging interaction uh, with regard to some of these different theories about the dog man and the werewolves and, and the beast of Jebedon or whatever. So, um, so that's all I got for now. I'm not going to do any question and answer right now, but I will be available for question and answer during the expert panel. And again, I want to thank all of you for showing up today. This is a really great turnout, and we're really excited to have you here.